Lord God, I pray that these words be an acceptable offering now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Many, many years ago, when I went off to college, I was intent on demonstrating to my parents and others that I was way deeper and more intellectual than they had ever thought, with good reason. But I thought a great idea would be for me to enroll in an introductory philosophy 101 course. That would show everybody. Yes, indeed, I'm deeper, more intellectual, more thoughtful. But if memory serves me correctly, during one of the very first sessions in that class, the professor asked us to name some of the worst types, the worst types of suffering and evil we could ever imagine. And as you'd guess, the, the responses were totally gross. They were awful. They, they, were, they were graphic. Then he asked this. He said, I, I want to ask you to identify the best sorts of pleasures that you could imagine. And as you'd guess, those responses were just carnal and indulgent. Then his conclusion after that class discussion was this. Since the kinds of evil that we can imagine were so much worse than the pleasures we could imagine would have been enjoyable, we therefore should doubt the existence of a good God. Welcome to college. That was it. That was it. And with that then, as you could imagine, <laughs> sort of just be, began for anybody who was a Christian the deprogramming process, and for anybody who was, was not a Christian, just affirmation of, of, of atheism, agnosticism. Welcome to college. So since then, though, I've come to see that although his logic was faulty, Getting there was faulty, but the conclusion actually in our day and age is actually pretty much, uh, I think, uh, uh, reasonable. Evil does seem to outweigh good if we're watching the news and looking at things on the Internet. And you go back, like, go back to the last century, and this is just one statistic I'll throw at you this morning. In the 1900s, as many as 25 million people were systematically slaughtered in organized genocidal massacres. People targeted for the color of their skin, for, for what they believe is a religion, for the language they speak, or just simply because they're living on land that somebody more powerful wants to take from them. So evil exists, and that's just one of the basics of the Christian faith. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was making much this same point regarding evil, and he's quoting the Old Testament, and he drops this encouragement on his readers, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. Now, if you're wondering who he's talking about, look in the mirror. All right, just wanted to cheer you up this morning a little bit. All have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat, this is nice, is open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, poisonous snakes, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. Aren't you glad you came this morning? Um, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, you've heard talk like this out of the Bible before as we've made points about sinfulness and evil. But you, I, I, I wonder if there's maybe one person here this morning who's wondering, are people really as bad as that? as Paul says, and I think the answer pretty clearly has always been yes. You go back to the beginning, all right, back to Genesis 6, and there is the Lord's testimony here. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. In the second half of that sentence there, you have three absolutes, all right? Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart, only evil all the time. So what was God's solution back then? Do you remember? What happened next? Well, it started to sprinkle, okay? And, and, and then the rain picked up a little bit, and God flooded the earth. And for what purpose then? If people are always evil all the time, flood the earth, well, first, to punish sin, a reminder that God takes sin seriously. And second, though, to start over through Noah and his family. And of Noah, it was written this, that he was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So, Paul, and he's also referred to as Saul this morning, same guy. Paul, Saul, knew all these things, and he wrote a bunch of the New Testament books. And we, um, we, we see in this morning's reading here, he's working with a guy named Barnabas to plant new churches and encourage other leaders so that more people could come to know Jesus. And, and my question is this, you know, if you don't know the, his background, do, do you think like he had his act all together? I mean, wouldn't you think that somebody that was allowed to write so much of the Bible and plant a bunch of churches, don't you think he would have been living like a pretty perfect life up until that point? And, um, and the answer, if you know this story, is that absolutely not. He, he in no way had his act together. This is his own testimony. He said, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. And so, you know, I, I know, in fact, in a little bit we're going to come up here and we're going to confess our sins. But I wonder who in this room would, would like stand up, look around, see friends, you know, family, and say, I am the worst person in this room. Anybody? I'm just kind of dying to know. Anybody? So, no. Right? And Paul's saying, I'm not only the worst guy in the room, I'm the worst guy ever. His life wasn't close to perfect. And we got evidence of all this last week. If you were here last week, I know you remember every word I spoke, but we got plenty of evidence last week when we read this about the early days of the early church, that Saul, Paul, okay, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and he asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that means Christians, follower of Jesus, Men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So here's the deal. In Acts chapter 8, he's a total thug, right? He hates Jesus. He hates the church. He hates those that are in the church, are thinking of coming into the church. You can only imagine the horrible things that he's said and thought and done to Christian people. So that's Acts chapter 8. But then by Acts chapter 11, which is this morning's reading, maybe nine or ten years later, he's a totally, totally different man. Something's happened, and it's in Acts chapter 9. And this is what we read there, that as he neared Damascus on a journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why, are you per why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? He asked. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless because they heard the sound and didn't see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind. He didn't eat or drink anything. One moment, he hates Jesus and anyone who would follow him. 
And in the next moment, he is in total submission to Jesus. He's been, he's been driven to his knees. He's been blinded. And, and I'm, I'm not thinking he's singing, in the crushing, in the pressing. <laughs> Sorry, that's sin when I sing in public, all right? But I don't think he's singing, oh, you're making new wine, God. I think he's thinking, what is going on? Because I'm just doing my job that I think God's given me, rounding up Christians and throwing them in jail. Maybe the worst ones, we're, we're going to let them get punished, maybe, maybe killed. But Paul's thinking, I'm just doing my job here. And then out of nowhere, driven to his knees, and he's blinded. And I think in that moment, because I, I, I don't know, I, I identify with him because of a couple of things that have happened in my life, but I'm thinking in that moment, he maybe gets one or two seconds beyond the initial trauma, and he's thinking, oh my God, I'm still alive. What's going on here? Because he knows God's power. He knows that God is mighty. He knows that God knows all things. He knows that God could just crush him like a rope, which is what he was. He knows God could do all of these things, but he's still standing. His heart is still beating. His, his, his lungs are still taking in air. Why is he allowed to keep living in this moment if he's been so bad? And I would imagine there's somebody in this room who's wondering the same thing. Why is my heart still beating? Why are my lungs, my brain, everything still working? I don't deserve it. I've got a past. I've got a history. Amen. Welcome to the club. Why are you still putting up with me, Lord? And the reason is that God had a plan. God had a plan for Paul. God's got a plan for you. Jesus told him this. Here's why. I've appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you've seen me. Tell them what I'll show you in the future. Jesus is saying that to Paul. I've got a feeling he's saying that to you and me this morning. Why are we still standing? What are we doing? Do we just come and absorb and suck up and consume? Or is there something God's calling forth from us to have an impact, to have an effect on the people around us? See, Jesus picked this person who absolutely despised him and his followers, and then he gives them the job of being an evangelist and a missionary and an apostle. It's like Jesus is saying, look, I know you hate me, but now you get to be my ambassador. I know you despise my followers, but now I'm going to send you to create new ones. I, I, I know that when you've heard the gospel, it makes you cringe. Now I'm going to send you out so that others will be able to hear the gospel and respond to it. To, to my sense, maybe to your sense of justice, this makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And I think he's thinking, and I think we're wondering at times, why him? What, why Paul? Not a fit. But the Lord said this, Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles. That means non-Jews. And to kings, that means people in authority, obviously, as well as to the people of Israel, the Jews. Now, last week we heard the story of Philip being sent to the despised Samaritans. And so here in a similar way, Paul is going to be sent to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, again whom he hated, among non-Jews called Gentiles, whom he had despised. He had nothing to do with Gentiles. 
And then what is being said here as well is that he's also going to be sent to the Jews, his own people, who would now hate him and would soon try and kill him because they thought he had betrayed the Jewish faith and was turning to Jesus. And so what a calling. Can you imagine? What a calling to be sent to, to, to minister both to people whom he hated and who hated him. What a dreadful job. Can you imagine getting up in the morning? I get to go and preach to people that I hate who hate me. Now, these days, um, a little break from that, these days we are actually recruiting right now at All Saints. We're recruiting, looking for a recent seminary graduate to come here for a couple of years. Um, Chris Lee, whom we know and love, has uh, planted the church down in Swansboro, and a couple of dozen people that we know and love are down there with Chris and Frank, and we were so blessed, so happy that that has gotten legs underneath and is sustaining. Um, and so the next step in our process is that we're going to bring a, a guy in this summer, hopefully for a couple of years. And we've been talking to a couple, and there's, there's one we talked to the other day. And I just want to ask so, sort of like, can you imagine if during our interview, um, we're, we're talking to this guy, and he's like, well, I, I do need to tell you that I hate Jesus, and I cannot stand Christians. And then we would say, well, gosh, remember Paul? Perfect, this just might work. <laughs> No. No. It makes no sense. It's kind of the point of all this this morning. I mean, Paul being allowed to get up out of the dirt makes no sense. God letting him be able to see again makes no sense after what he had done. At least to me, maybe to you. But God's thinking a different thing. What, what, if, what if the Lord is thinking this? If I can save Paul from himself, maybe others can be saved as well. What if God's thinking, if I crush this man and then rebuild him, that'll demonstrate the, the transforming power of my Holy Spirit, my ability to bring new life. What if God's thinking, if I send this man to those who hate him, maybe others can learn how I loved and died for those who hated me? Maybe God's thinking, if I let him tell his story, others will learn they don't need to be defined by their stories, that new life is available. Maybe God's thinking, if I allow him to suffer terribly, but then I enable him to endure, that'll teach others about my own suffering and my endurance, and that they can endure as well. Maybe God's thinking, if I do something that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, choosing Paul, that'll demonstrate that my ways are higher and better and purer and more holy than man's ways could ever be that through this one who everybody thought was so wise, the world's wisdom is being revealed as absolute foolishness. What if God thinks differently from you and me? So, so what did God do? We go back to Acts chapter 9, and God sent this man that was terrified of Saul, Paul. And this man came to him with this, calls him brother. That was nice. I am terrified of you, brother Saul. But the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food he was strengthened. And for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately, immediately, they still didn't trust him, immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this a man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? If I kept reading that passage, it, it would tell us that, 
that Paul had been proving that Jesus was the Messiah. So over and over again, this brilliant man honored, acclaimed on the religious fast track to success. We find him now referring to himself as Jesus' slave. And that's a rough, dirty word in this day and age. But back then, it wasn't uncommon for a slave and, and master to develop a, a affection for one another. And slaves would often stay and work even if they were offered freedom. And honestly, that's what Paul is saying. That's who I'm saying. He's saying, I'm a slave, and I'm glad to be Jesus' slave. But the deal is this. It really wasn't his choice. Because Jesus has said, and this then was being fulfilled in, uh, this was being fulfilled. Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you so that you might bear, go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. We heard that in this morning's reading. And um, I don't know where you are in terms of thinking about predestination, free will, and all that stuff. Um, to me, honestly, it doesn't matter a whole lot. Of course, like I said earlier, I'm not that deep. I don't get too, <laughs> I just don't, because listen, if I don't have free will, I'll never know it. If Paul didn't have free will, he'd never know it. If you and I don't have free will, we won't know it. It sure does seem like a long time ago, I made a decision to follow Jesus. And Jesus is saying, well, you know what? You didn't choose me, I chose you. And when I unpack that, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that must mean that he set this whole deal up mean that by his love and grace he gave me faith to believe all this stuff and so as Paul says in 2nd Corinthians you and I can then say that therefore if anyone is in Christ he's a new creation the old has come I'm sorry the old has passed away the new has come see he's working throughout the Mediterranean he's he's there in this town of Antioch and he's going, people are coming in, leaving, going back and forth. They're being equipped and, and sent out. And see, one of the neat things that happens with Paul, and it's happened with a bunch of people that come to Jesus late in life, is that the skills, the aptitudes, the ways that God has blessed you in the past when you weren't doing his work, now all that gets sanctified. And so all your training, all your knowledge, all your negotiating and speaking skills, the way of persuading people, all that that Paul was using against God in the past now has been sanctified, and that's going to be used for the advancement of the kingdom. Indeed, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And all of this was free, but none of it was cheap. Jesus didn't say then, and he doesn't say now, come as you are, but there's no need to change. All right? Paul, Paul was compelled to write this, I don't want you to copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, Paul knew that he couldn't manufacture anything. He couldn't concoct it. He couldn't, he couldn't earn it. But he also knew that being... He had been struck down and blinded for a reason. And that this was just the beginning of a new life. And that this new life would be marked by new priorities. And, and in so doing, God would give him an inexhaustible endurance. And he wrote this to the Philippians. I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. There would be a lot more pressing. There would be a lot more crushing for Paul. And yet he's saying, God's given me endurance. So I'm not, I'm not quitting. I'm going to press on. So I'm going to wrap up right now, but I hope this story of his is a, is a good challenge and an encouragement of, for you and, and maybe as you think about people that you love. I bet everybody in this room could list the, the names of a couple of people that it just sort of feels like they're not really in with the Lord, not really living in a way that's going to have them uh, uh, finding those those pearly gates at the end, and our hearts should break for them. 
um, we should be crushed for them. But I want to encourage you that God loves them more than you and I ever could. And then for those that are hearing this and they're thinking, I am Paul or I was Paul, I want you to hear this. Your past need not define you, nor need it disqualify you, okay? Your past need not define you. Your past need not disqualify you. No, no matter who you were, God has somebody new. Whether you or your loved one, no matter how, you, how far you or they have strayed, no matter the doubt, uh, the denial, no matter if you or they have despised Jesus in the past or his church or his followers, I just want to encourage you, there's not only room for you, there's not only room, there's, there's not only room for you in, in God's kingdom, but there's work as well. I mean, there, it's one thing to be invited in and for the Lord to say, okay, I'll let you in, all right, by the skin of your teeth. All right, and I barely love you. You're not going to hear that from God. What you're going to hear is, oh my God, I'm so happy to have you in my kingdom, the Lord's saying. And look, come, learn, grow, and then I'm going to need you to reach some other people. I'm going to have to put you to work. Let that be an encouragement this morning because He values you and He has a unique role just for you. And I want you to remember that you are personally known. And in spite of that, okay, if God knows everything about you, are you a little bit like, oh, golly, concerned? But in spite of the fact that you are personally known, praise God, you are perfectly loved. Amen? So let me pray. Uh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this story of radical transformation. And I know, Lord, there are dozens of stories in this room of radical transformation. And there are more that are going to happen. Lord, you have your plan. You have your ways. And Lord, your will be done. And so let us not give up praying and anticipating the growth and the salvation of the people around us. And Lord God, let us not give up praying for and anticipating our own growth, our own transformation. Holy Spirit, come. Encourage us, we pray. Bless us. Let us look to Paul as good news as we wander this life, Lord God. Shepherd us and encourage us. Save us, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.